this afternoon session. Uh, we have the honor to, to introduce you to Jose Luis Medina Franco. And his talk is about advancing epigenetic genetic drug discovery with epi-informatics. So welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you so much for the, for the introduction. I really want to thank the organizers, to, to Liz and all the organizing committee for the kind invitation to, to, to join the BioFIS 2022. And this afternoon, I would like to talk about, on behalf of our research group, applications of um, chem informatics and machine learning for uh, epigenetic drug discovery. So this is the outline of the talk. First, I'm going to give a very, very brief introduction on epigenetics and epidrugs with a special focus on inhibitors of DNA methyl transferases. Then I'm going to mention the goal and the specific aims of the research program. Then I will move to uh, the results of two main uh, computational studies that we are conducting in this regard. And at the end, we conclude with a brief summary. So uh, what is epigenetics? Well, epigenetics are modifications that, that happen to the chromosomes without alteration of the DNA sequence that lead to a stable phenotype. There are three main epigenetic targets with families, uh, writers, erasers, and, 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 and readers. So it is known that alterations in histone methylation and acetylation are frequently dysregulated in cancer cells and in other diseases as well. Perhaps historically, methylation was the first epigenetic uh, modification associated with cancer. We will see that there are other diseases coming up. And as we will see also in the next slides, the process is mediated by a family of enzymes called DNA methyltransferases or DNMTs. Now, over the past few years, here at the top uh, chart, we can see like, an increase in the interest of the scientific community in studying epigenetics itself. Like, this is presented in the, in the orange bars. Also, there is an association between uh, alterations in epigenetics um, factors with diseases. As I mentioned before, historically, the, 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 the most common is cancer, presented here in, 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 in uh, light blue. But more recently, uh, there are more and more evidence of other diseases associated with alterations in, in uh, epigenetics, like diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and others. Now, here at the bottom, we are also see the number of peer-reviewed papers focusing on epigenetics for drug discovery applications. And it's clear, clearly see the, 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 the trend in, in the... The, the increase of the interest, and also more and more, perhaps here because of the scale, it is not uh, very dramatic, but uh, in recent years are uh, being implemented computational studies, and now more recently, artificial intelligence or epigenetic drug discovery. Now, currently there are eight small molecules approved by the FDA for the treatment of, especially for cancer diseases now that are targeting different epigenetic target families. The seven of them are presented here at the, at the top. Uh, but also there are several other small molecules under clinical development. Just a few examples of, uh, of those uh, compounds are uh, presented at the bottom of the slide. And a much more comprehensive review, there are about like 40, 50 compounds under clinical development, a review in this paper by Paula Rimondo and, and uh, her colleagues. Now, as I mentioned, uh, DNA methylation, it's one of these epigenetic changes. Uh, chemically, it's a very simple process. It's an addition of a methyl group to the carbon number five of, of cytosine residues. And this process, as I mentioned before, is mediated by this family of enzyme, the DNA methyl transferases. Now, in cancer cells, we see an overexpression of these enzymes, in particular a hypermethylation of tumor suppressor genes. There are two uh, DNMTs, uh, DNMT uh, uh, 3A and 3B, 
that regulate the novel methylation and DNMT1. It's uh, in charge of the maintenance of the methylation patterns. Now, most of the DNMTs have a catalytic domain except DNMT3L, but all of them have a regulatory domain. Now, currently we can find in Protein Data Bank several structures of DNMTs, uh, some of them of uh, human DNMTs, or from uh, bacteria and, and other species. In the table, I'm just showing a few examples. And more recently, well, a year ago, uh, the, the, the company GlaxoSmithKline uh, published the first crystallographic structure of uh, the catalytic domain of DNMT1 co crystallized with a small molecule that uh, they identify by high throughput screening. Very interestingly, this compound is quite potent for DNMT1 with an IC50 of 36 nanomolar. And in addition, this compound is also selective because it did not inhibit DNMT3A and DNMT3B. It's basically no inhibition. Oh, excuse me. Now, here in, the, in this slide, uh, we are uh, showing uh, just a few representative small molecules that are known to inhibit DNMT1 and other DNMTs. In particular, I like to highlight the, the couple of cytosine analogs. Those two cytosine analogs are one of the eight small molecules approved by the FDA by the treatment of, in this case, uh, for the treatment of mesodysplastic uh, syndrome. But as we can see, by the own nature of the chemical structure are cytosine uh, analogs. One of them is 5-ASA uh, cytidine and the other one 5-ASA deoxycytidine. That the only tiny difference with cytosine is the, the nitrogen at position number, number 5. So these compounds are extremely potent but are also quite toxic because are incorporated into the DNA. And for this reason, there is uh, the interest of the scientific community to identify other inhibitors with a very different chemical scaff. And here are just a few examples. And the, the small molecules come from different sources, from different strategies. There are several natural products. I'm here just showing a couple of them. Also, this uh, strategy in drug discovery that we uh, heard a lot, the drug repurposing for treatment of COVID, is also being approached to identify potential inhibitors. There are actually few drugs uh, approved for other diseases, cardiovascular diseases, that are now being repositioned or studying uh, for repositioning for cancer treatment. Examples of compounds that have been identified uh, identify by computational or virtual screening, we will see some of those compounds later. Other molecules obtained by traditional medicinal chemistry synthesis perform a lot in the, in the industry and also in academia. And finally, a few other examples of molecules here at the bottom identified by high throughput screening. Remarkably, uh, the, the, that compound that I showed in the previous slide, uh, quite uh, selective and co-crystallized with uh, DNMT1, was identified by high throughput screening. So th th this, uh, in this slide, also in addition to show the chemical structures, is also to emphasize that there is not one single or the best technique or to emphasize the computational studies can do it all. It's basically a combination of, of approaches. Well, with this very brief introduction on epigenetics and, and inhibitors, now I'd like to, to state the goal of the research program. We want to identify inhibitors of DNMTs and other epigenetic targets using this approach uh, combining computational methods with uh, the experimental validation. Now, just in, in terms of um, nomenclature, uh, so to speak, the, the, the use of computational approaches apply for epigenetic drug discovery, having called uh, epi-informatics. But, but anyway, in the next slide, I'd like to show advances in the results that we have been obtaining in, in our group in two basic uh, specific goals, specific aims. One of them is to uh, develop predictive models using machine learning to anticipate potential activity of inhibitors 
of epigenetic targets. And the second goal is the application of those predictive models with other computational techniques to identify other compounds. So uh, everybody here in, in the audience knows that uh, machine learning is founded in data. And of course, uh, the major public resources of data that contains chemical structures with biological activity are PubChem and Campbell. Uh, here I'm just uh, representing a few numbers that uh, one of the most recent versions of PubChem contain information for more than one, one of three uh, million compounds annotated with more than 207 million bioactivity data, and the data is increasing constantly. So the first step, of course, was to extract the structure activity relationships from these databases of compounds that have been tested with different epigenetic targets. So for this part of the study, we focus our attention specifically in, in Campbell, that we know has a lot of overlap with, with PopChem. So uh, here in this table, I'm showing a, a short list. The list is uh, longer, but it's a short list of um, the number of small molecules that have been tested with different epigenetic targets and the percentage of active compounds. So just for the sake of this study, we define active, those compounds with an IC50 of 10 micromolar. So here I'd like to emphasize a couple of things. There are um, epigenetic targets that, ha that have been heavily studied by the industry and by academia, for instance, like histone acetylases, the HDAX. There are more uh, than 3,000 compounds. And as I was saying, the data is increasing. And there are other epigenetic targets, like uh, bromodomains, that have been much less explored this far. So based on this data, uh, one student in, in, the, in the lab, Norberto Sanchez, develop uh, different uh, machine learning models using uh, extended connectivity fingerprints, uh, radius 4, and RDK fingerprints. Also, he developed consensus models combining both fingerprints. Overall, uh, we obtained uh, like a acceptable uh, precision and, and sensibility in terms of the binary classification and in target, uh, target prediction. Again, all this is based on the Campbell data at that time. So the next step was to implement the, these models into a web server so that everybody can, can use the, these models even for the non-experts. Non so uh, again, Norberto Sanchez, as part of his uh, PhD thesis, developed this uh, web server, Epigenetic Target Profiler. It's an open uh, web server that can be accessed in, in this uh, address. And what the server does is for an input compound of the interest of the user can just draw the chemical structure directly or input the smiles strings. If not just input the, the chemical structure, the server will rapidly of, uh, obtain the, the smiles strings. And uh, the, the server will basically predict the epigenetic activity of that small compound with a panel of 55 epigenetic targets. So this is basically the, the, the type of output that the user will see. It's basically the input structure, the query, uh, query molecule. The server performs an internal um, standardization of the molecule. And here at the bottom, we, uh, the, the user will have the list of epigenetic targets for which that compound is uh, predicted to be active. Uh, the table contains in the last column a, a, a quartile. This goes from quartile one to, to quartile four. And this is just a, like a rough measure of the confidence of, on the prediction. So all the details are like published in, in the reference, but just basically uh, what the quartile means is that how similar is the query molecule to the chemical structures that are stored in Campbell. So of course, if the compound is quite dissimilar, it's not going to be uh, predicted anything. So it just 
very, very basic. And what was kind of in interesting, kind of a, a palm in, in the back, when we released this in, in, the, um, uh, in LinkedIn. So Professor uh, Andre Ursu like, tested the, the server with the compounds that his group is develop, uh, studying at the Scripps Research Institute. And he put uh, this comment that the, the server predicted correctly the, the compound that they are studying. So that was nice, nice to read. Anyway, now uh, the next step is now for us to use these models. And of course, uh, since we are screening uh, large libraries, we don't do it like one by one. So we use the code. But, uh, by the way, the code is freely available. It's available in GitHub as supplementary information. So for screening compound databases, we follow this uh, protocol that is pretty much a standard what is done in the industry, in academia. So the first step is to prepare, or what we call, when we talk to experimentalists, to purify our compounds, to prepare our databases. Second step is to perform the actual uh, in silico or computational filtering. Third step is to conduct the experimental screening of the selected uh, computational hits. And the last step is to perform optimization of those molecules. In terms of the compound libraries, we're using libraries from different sources. In the next slide, I'm going to talk about uh, a bit more about the, the compound libraries. For the computational screening, here we use a combination of methods including similarity searching, that is extremely fast, is very intuitive, molecular docking and dynamics, when the crystallographic structure is available. Fortunately for the NMTs, there are several of them, as I showed before, and using the uh, machine learning models in the epigenetic target profiler. And in, in the next slides, I'm going to show an example of the combination of, of uh, several of these techniques. Now, for the experimental validation, uh, the first step, so we are, uh, we are a computational group, but what we do is to either collaborate with academic groups or contract uh, service companies to perform the enzymatic inhibition assays. And here we are very open for collaborations to further investigate the, the compounds. And uh, for the optimization, also this is done in collaboration with other research groups working on chemical synthesis and testing of the analogs to improve the potency. Now, uh, regarding the compound libraries, at the moment uh, we are uh, using uh, natural products and food chemicals. Uh, Perhaps now the uh, largest uh, natural product library in the public domain is coconut with roughly half million of molecules. We also have uh, an internal database that is called uh, Biofakim, our natural products identified in Mexico. Well, anyway, the database is for, for the public use. If anyone wants to also screen that, that library. It ha has, contains a roughly 500 compounds, and also a food database that contains around 22,000 food chemicals. So we also uh, are in, in close contact, as I said, uh, with uh, other groups working on, on synthesis, for instance, with the Universidad Autónoma del Estado de Morelos in, in, in Mexico, and a group in Canada, Professor Alexander Gagnon, this working synthesis of uh, potential inhibitors. For the commercial libraries, the primary source is the uh, SYNC database. As we know, it's a compendium of other commercial libraries. And recently, there are several chemical companies that are releasing uh, or are working on focused libraries. These are synthetic compounds that are enriched in this case, with potential epigenetic active compounds, the chemical structures are available. And if uh, the research group or company identifies something interesting, well, the compounds are physically um, available for, for purchase. 
So uh, we start this uh, research program quite um, like 12, 12 years ago, screening a public library, the, the National Cancer Institute database. I'm going to go through this process very fast because it was basically our starting point in this uh, research area. So this database contains uh, more than 260,000 compounds. The first step was to remove those compounds with uh, really low uh, probability to become a drug, let's say compounds with very uh, large molecular weight, potential toxicity, and, and so on. So then uh, we perform a sequential uh, or cascade docking using different docking programs with increasing uh, predictive ability. Of course, every time it, the, the process becomes more and more slow, but at the end we use a combination of three different docking programs, GlideXP, Gold, and, and Autodoc, and select the 20, uh, uh, 24 consensus hits, and of those 24 uh, consensus hits, 15 were physically available for experimental testing. The assays were performed at a time in collaboration with a group uh, in, in Heidelberg, in Germany, in the German Cancer Center, and half of the compounds show experimentally around 30% uh, of inhibition of VNMT1. So the percent of inhibition was not that, that uh, surprising at the time, but at least the chemical scaffolds were different. So what are uh, attractive starting points for the step number four, the optimization. So interestingly, and this is uh, purely by chance, one of those small molecules was a natural product, nanomycin A, that turns out to be selective for DNMT3B, something that we were not expecting. Inhibit DNMT3B with an IC50 or 500 nanomolar and did not inhibit DNMT1. In addition, this natural product also show the methylating activity in different cancer cell lines. And well, that story dates back to 2010. And so far, there are no other selective inhibitor for DNMT3B. So going back to our list of uh, experimental heat compounds, in the following years, that molecule that I'm highlighting there was used as a starting point for similarity searching. Really, really basic computational studies comparing the chemical structure in 2D and in 3D with a database of approved drugs, specifically with uh, drug bank. And the heat compound, well, the most similar compound was or salicin, and as you can clearly see in the picture, is extremely similar, and indeed, or salicin also inhibit uh, DNMT1. Independently, the group of Alexander Gagnon in, in Canada, just by looking at the literature, picked up this uh, compound and also optimized the activity for DNMT1. Also independently, the group of Massimo Bartinaria in University of Turin also took that compound as a heat, uh, as a starting point and optimized activity of that molecule. And more recently, a group uh, in, in China, Professor um, Yuan, uh, also took this compound and uh, his research group developed dual inhibitors, not only of the mt one but also HDAC inhibitors. That there are evidence in the literature that dual inhibitors are better than single epigenetic target inhibitors. Now, uh, more recently in a group, we have been performing a virtual screening of additional compound libraries. And uh, this is a, a, a list of those compounds that we more recently identified in 2021, a couple of them uh, gliburide and panavinostat are approved drugs for the treatment of diabetes. So with potential um, repurposing capabilities, uh, both compounds inhibit moderate or a little bit uh, with, with a weak activity for, for DNMT1. Diaflavin, um, food chemical, polyphenol found in, in black tea, also inhibit uh, DNMT1, also with kind of moderate towards uh, weak activity, 
And the other uh, compounds that I'm showing here in the slide are synthetic compounds. And currently, we are collaborating with um, Federica Cati at Arkansas State University. Uh, she has a lot of experience in medicinal chemistry. And one student in, in, in the lab, Diana Prado, is working with a computational guided optimization of this molecule, and they are now working on the analog synthesis and testing of analogs to improve the, the activity that currently is not, is not that, that impressive. So going back to the epigenetic uh, focused libraries that I was showing, um, uh, this is one of the most recent projects by uh, Alexis Padilla. Uh, he uh, did the research of how many chemical companies are actually releasing those uh, focused libraries. Um, at the time of this study, uh, he came up with a list of 11 and putting all those compounds together after data curation, the compounds are a bit uh, more than 53,000 uh, small molecules. The, the table here shows the number of compounds per, per chemical company, per chemical vendor. Just before doing any virtual screen, the first step was just to kind of verify the potential drug likeness of this molecule. This is a very simple analysis, analyzing what is called the visual, visual representation of chemical space. It's kind of a simple clustering based on the physical chemical uh, properties of these compounds. And the end result is that in this, this chemical libraries, as the vendor says, seems to be uh, drug-like. Drug so in addition, well, to, to keep characterizing and exploring the contents of this library, also we perform uh, this visualization of chemical space using the technique that is called constellation maps. So this is kind of type of clustering of the chemical structures. Maybe uh, the most remarkable uh, feature of these uh, maps is that each point, each uh, circle, represents not only one chemical structure, but a family of chemical structures, like a series of analogs. And at the, at the bottom, we are highlighting in blue uh, the coverage in chemical space of the different um, epigenetic fo focused libraries by different vendors in this chemical space. So the take home message of this uh, visualization is to at least here visually analyze that, for instance, the focus library from ChemDiff in, in the second uh, graph is much more diverse than the focus libraries from other chemical vendors. And again, these analyses are extremely, extremely fast. It takes, takes a day to, to do it are not computationally expensive. Another way to characterize the libraries is implementing the chemical library networks. This is a, an approach that developed Ramon Alain Miranda at the University of Florida. The feature of this visualization of chemical space is, as, is that each node represents a, an entire chemical library. And here, the closer the data points means that the chemical libraries are more similar to each other and the opposite, right? So very, very fast to, to compute this type of uh, analysis. Okay, so once we uh, kind of characterize, is, this is our step number one, to purify, characterize our compounds. Then the second step is to do the actual filtering, the actual virtual screening. So to do that, the first step was to apply the machine learning models. So, and out of the 53,000 53, compounds, uh, 119 show the best predictions. Second step, also in a cascade or sequential virtual screening approach, uh, we did, well, Alexis did, consensus docking using um, MOE, autodoc and autodoc bina, and rescoring the, the compounds we, because we know overall the docking scores overall are not that reliable. For that, for the rescoring, uh, we use the extended connectivity interaction features. Uh, uh, that approach was developed by um, Norberto Sanchez, the, 
methodologies published in, in, in this reference. And at the end, after consensus docking or rescoring, we are selected 20 compounds for experiments, for enzymatic inhibition assays. This is a partial list of the heat compounds with the docking scores and with the, the rescoring scheme with extended connectivity interaction features. And experimentally, uh, several uh, quinolines of those 20 compounds show kind of decent uh, inhibition between 10 and 40 percent. Interestingly, they uh, show up two compounds uh, with very similar chemical structures showing uh, at the top. As you can see, the only difference are two methyl groups. The compound with two methyl groups, it's a moderate inhibitor. But if you remove the two methyl groups, the compound becomes an activator, a strong activator. So this is a kind of a nice or textbook example of what is called an activity cliff. A small structural modification that has a large impact in the property. But uh, remarkably, uh, Again, out of those 20 compounds, two quinazolines here at, at, at the slide uh, had a very potent inhibit, uh, inhibition for DNMT1 with an IC50, one of them uh, 30 nanomolar, other one 81 nanomolar. As compared to the internal control, it's adenosyl uh, homocysteine. Uh, well, uh, it's actually a natural inhibitor. It's an auto-inhibitor. SAH has an IC50 of 20.34 micromolar, so the two quinazolines were significantly more potent than the own uh, reference. And also, the two compounds uh, show selectivity, did not inhibit uh, DNMT3B and inhibit uh, DNMT3A, but uh, were much, much uh, weaker. So, and as you can recall, the inhibition of the GlaxoSmith, compound, uh, GlaxoSmith client compound is about 30 nanomolar. So this is kind of comparable with a different chemical scaff. Now looking in the literature, uh, these quinazolines uh, have also reported a strong, very potent inhibition, uh, IC50 of 6 nanomolar with another epigenetic target, G9A. So these compounds are becoming kind of promising um, as dual inhibitors of DNMT1 and also G9A. So in order to kind of exploring the precise mechanism of inhibition, uh, Edgar Lopez, master student, now, now is, using the, is doing the PhD studies, uh, he did uh, molecular dynamics, well, first molecular docking, then molecular dynamics, to try to understand uh, how these quinazolines are uh, inhibiting DNMT1. So to make the story short, the outcome of this study was that the uh, uh, quinazoline seems to be interacting with the regulatory domain, specifically with the CXXC domain, not with the catalytic domain. Now, experimentally, also we send this compound to the same uh, contract lab, reaction biology. They perform competition assays with the natural substrate, with DNA, and the results, the experimental results, show that this compound did not compete with uh, DNA. So, experimentally, we have sort of evidence that are not binding in the catalytic domain. So putting both things together, simulation and experiment, seems that these compounds are binding in the regulatory domain. That is also kind of exciting because uh, it can be a very promising scaffolds to be selective for other, uh, well, for DNMTs, as we kind of saw. So, just to summarize. So, uh, today I talk about the identification of new DNMT inhibitors with new chemical scaffolds. These new chemical scaffolds are becoming a starting points for optimization, what is called uh, in the medicinal chemistry community, the heat 
to lead optimization process. One of those uh, uh, hits, very interesting, uh, nanomycin, selective inhibitor for DNMT3B, and those quinazolines that inhibit DNMT1 and also it's have reported activity for G9A. And in the first part, I just show how uh, we are using uh, this public data to develop predictive models, and some of these models have been implemented in the public in epigenetic target profiler. So a couple of perspectives. Now, we are, of course, quite interested in these uh, machine learning uh, models to predict dual inhibition of DNMT1 and HDAX simultaneously. So this is kind of the, the first step, just the computational protocol, uh, computational validation, but of course the next validation are the, the experiments. And now we're working with experimentalists to actually make the compounds and, and test the compounds. So second major perspective is the novel design. We know that the novel design is now being heavily explored in, in, the, in the community, but for some reason has not been explored for DNMTs. So we are, well, uh, Diana Prado, it's a, her project. Uh, she's working on the novel design uh, of uh, DNMT inhibitors. And now I'd like to, uh, well, take, of course, time to acknowledge all the current and former students in the lab that have been doing all the computational studies. Several of the ideas come from their own minds, their own experience, that they suggest, why don't do, we do this, why don't we do that? So a lot of credit also goes to them in that regard, in addition to the computational um, part. Of course, many thanks to the different collaborators doing in all the experiments, trying to, to make all, converting these nice pictures into something that can actually be useful for uh, epigenetic drug targets, basically, epigenetic drugs. And of course, many thanks to the different institutions providing the, the funding. And I'd like to take this couple of, well, one minute to invite the community, the, the, the audience here to, to invite you. It's a, a today free, a free uh, virtual event to kind of promote the cheminformatics in, in, in Latin America. Currently uh, in France, they are doing a school of cheminformatics for over 20 years. In, in Mexico, in Latin America, we don't, don't have, we, I haven't heard anything. So this is kind of the, the first, or one of the first steps into, in towards that direction. So everybody is welcome to join. And the topics are, uh, there is a bar variety. For instance, the Alexander Barnek, that is actually the one leading the School of FKM Informatics in France, is talking about chemical space. There are also applications of cheminformatics in natural product uh, uh, drug discovery in uh, prediction of uh, toxicity. And well, with that, I'd like to, to finish. Many thanks again, Luis, the scientific uh, committee for the invitation, and many thanks to all of you for, for your attention. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Jose Luis, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you for accepting our invitation, and I particularly like very much your work. And I have a, a couple of questions, very general, because I'm not a specialist in, in your field. But uh, the first one regarding the machine learning approach. I've, I've, I've heard, I've read many uh, about these alpha fault. These alpha fault uh, algorithms, maybe you, you are uh, familiar with that, is a, is a artificial intelligence machine learning approach to try to determine, and very successfully, as in fact, they have determined the three-dimensional structure of uh, uh, hundreds of, if not thousands of proteins, and developed by this uh, Google Mind uh, company. So how this, would you say that is related to the, to the algorithm that, that you and your group are developing? I understand that you have a website, website it's 
Is this correct? Is that correct? Yes. So yeah, th thank you so much for, for, for your question. Yeah, indeed that, that project is making a, a lot of uh, like good noise in the drug discovery area because are providing uh, a template to design drugs, where potential drugs can uh, fit nicely into the, into the targets. So there is a lot of excitement and it's very useful because for most of the drug targets that are approved in, in general, uh, the chemical structures, uh, the um, crystallographic structures are not known. So those models are definitely, definitely extremely valuable. But also we need, with excitement comes the, the, the caution because uh, are very uh, great starting points to start identifying the heat compounds, the very first promising scaffolds, but in the drug discovery process there are much more things happening that are not considered just in the crystallographic or simulated structure. It's like metabolism, especially metabolism, toxicity. Yeah, so, so I guess that this, uh, this alpha fold program only relates to try to determine the three-dimensional structure of the protein folding, but in a, well, I, I, I don't know if that's the correct word, but in a static way, so it's not, not the coupling with the... Exactly, exactly, just like a a picture, a static picture of the 3D structure yeah. of the target. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, any other question? All right, then we thank Jose Luis. Thank you very much for thank you. accepting your invitation. Now we move on to the next speaker. Is David Reyes around? Yeah, well, uh, David Reyes is uh, talking about from Alzheimer's disease to the identification of new conformational population of lipids. Thank you for accepting your, our invitation. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so. Do I stop? Okay, so. I would like to start by thanking <laughs> Luis and all the committee for inviting me. I have been really, I have been really enjoying this um, conference, I would say. I really miss to be with people. <laughs> I really miss to be <laughs> next to each other. And I would like also to say that this talk is thought for undergrads. So please, undergrads, participate, try to hear. I'm also trying to like, pick something for like, professors. Well, my name is Angel David, actually. I usually call myself, for English purposes, David Reyes. Funny thing for Mexicans is that Angel is a female name. So I usually had a problem. <laughs> If I said, my name is Angel, <laughs> they would expect a female, and eh, I don't look that much like that. <laughs> well, the first thing I would like to say for undergrads particularly is connect, right? Try to follow as many researchers, professors as possible. They may have information and share information which will be useful for you, right? That's, that's important. And it's something that people usually don't say, right? For example, I mean, I'm a bad example. On Twitter, <laughs> they usually post a lot of positions for graduate students or postdocs. So try to follow those. Oh, okay. So I'm coming from CIMAT, which stands for Research Center in Mathematics. And I'm kind of proud to say that I'm, I'm the first one in CIMAT working with biophysical, computational biophysics. And in CIMAT, we do have a master's in statistical computing. And I'm saying this obviously for undergrads, but also for professors. We are open for collaborations. And as you can hear, we have been talking a lot about machine learning and artificial intelligence. So guess what? <laughs> we work on that, right? So you want to have like a, a strong knowledge 
on the mathematics, then you can either study there or have a collaboration with us. <laughs> for example, for undergrads, we do, well, CIMAT does uh, a scientific summer, so you can go there. Usually the main campus is in Guanajuato, and they even give you like hotels and stuff like that. In Monterey, we have something, not that much, but we do have stuff. Now, let's start with the talk. <laughs> and this talk will kind of address different things. For undergrads, I would like to share that not always what you are looking for is what you find. Science is more about making mistakes than having like, oh, such a good story, and oh, I thought that, and I made it. Sometimes you think something, and you just don't find it, or you find something else. That's kind of the way. Also, I would like to give you this idea, well, everybody has given you this idea that we can work with complex disease from the computational side, right? And as you can imagine, you can also use machine learning with those techniques. I have been hearing that a lot of undergrads are not asking questions. So please, if something is important about my talk, is this slide for you, undergrads. The only bad question is an unasked one. So don't be afraid of asking. Please. There are no bad questions. And the worst thing that can happen is that I may not know what you're asking. So don't be afraid of asking. Well, I would like to start kind of having this idea of cell, right? We all know that we are the basic form of life. Is, it's a cell. And it has a lot of um, organelles in order to work. And each different cell has different organelles and different proteins and everything. But I would like to just focus on the membrane. I'm actually more like a lipid guy. So my knowledge is on there. And membrane, it's quite an interesting thing because most of the research are focused on proteins. And the membrane, it's formed also by lipids, right? And the membrane is the way that the cell can communicate between the exterior and the interior, right? Like outside the cell, inside the cell. In order to communicate, you have well, those kind of green, bluish things that you can see on the screen, which are proteins, channels. But there are other things, like, well, <laughs> like lipids. And lipids, or phospholipids, usually are, you can see, okay, you cannot see. You can see that there are some kind of spheres with tails, most of them. Those spheres like kind of darker orange and the tails like yellowish orange. And those phospholipids, they have the quality that they are, the heads are hydrophilic, which means that they lack, like, likes water. And the tails are hydrophobic, which you can picture like they are afraid of water. So that's the reason you can see this double layer, this big layer with the heads to the top or at the bottom. Keep in mind that in the top there is water and in the bottom there also will be water because you have the outer part of the cell and the inner part. Well, let's now start talking about neurodegenerative disease. And this is quite complex, right? If we, if we know, <laughs> if we really know those diseases, then we could do something, right? Honestly, there are more questions than answers here. But something that we know is that those diseases are related with 
the aggregation of peptides, right? Either outside of the membrane or inside of the membrane. So we're looking for how those peptides aggregate, they start making clusters, and how those, pept those clusters can interact with membranes. Again, we don't exactly know how this uh, makes the disease itself, but there is a hint that it's correlated. Well, <laughs> those are the phospholipids. Or a classic example, DPPC, where you can have the polar group and the tails, which are hydrophobic. In order to study this, um, some collaborators in UK started working with the naked mole rat model. And this pretty animal, actually the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, <laughs> it was really hard to see these kind of pictures. But what is interesting about it is that it has naturally a lot of those peptides which are correlated with Alzheimer's disease. But this animal doesn't develop any Alzheimer's disease symptoms, right? So you can have an animal which has those peptides, but it doesn't have uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. What does that mean is, if we understand why the naked mole rat is able to have those peptides, those aggregations, and still not having the disease, then we can start working designing <laughs> some drugs to kind of mimic whatever is happening there, right? So a good biologist will think, well, let's compare it, right? And yeah, let's compare it with a mouse, a classic model for biologists. And mouse, mouses, or mice, now what I'm thinking, <laughs> they can develop Alzheimer's disease. If you mutate something there and make this peptide overproduce, then you can see symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So, as I said, the question is why? Where is the difference? So, I will kind of take advantage of, of the vocabulary, uh, so don't take me serious with what I'm gonna say, but let's picture that you open their brains, you put it, uh, how do you say licuadora? <laughs> well, licuadora, blender, yeah. You blend their, the brain, <laughs> sorry, and then somehow you measure what's inside that brain, right? So we do that, well, they do that <laughs> for both models. And let's see what are the differences. So my co well, our collaborator, Frankel Daniel, in UK, University of Newcastle, they saw or measure that naked mole rat actually has twice cholesterol than the mouse. When they go for the sphingomelin, they also saw some difference there, which is that the naked mole rat has half of sphingomelin than the mouse. For other lipids, they don't find any relevant difference. Nor for phospholipids, phospholipids and nor for ceramid. So, Yeah, if I recall correctly, yeah. But I'm not experimentally, so. <clears throat> okay, now, what they did was, okay, well, what they did was, now that you have these uh, lipids, and let's think like an like a ink, you want to, to paint a surface, right? And then once you paint a the surface, then you can use 
AFM, Atomic Force Microscope, to see the surface roughness, right? So, the picture on the right, you can see that most of them, most of this picture, it's black, with some yellow points. You can imagine those yellow points as little mountains there, right? So, we can say that pretty much this is flat, and this picture on the right side is the mouse model. If we now see the left picture, you can see that there are kind of mountains with like bigger mountains, right? Also picture that on the right side you have up to four nanometers, but on the left side up to six nanometers. So that is telling us that, it, that there is phase separation there. You have a lot of lipids that somehow they're making bigger mountains. And also other lipids that they are plain. So that's what I'm saying about phase separation. Some lipids are making mountains, and a lot of them, and others are just plain, right? Again, compare it with the right, and you can, let's say one pixel is one lipid. Here you will have like a couple of lipids making mountains, and there you will have a lot of them. Now, those mountains are related with ordered lipids, which pretty much is, picture the tails in the right picture. The blue ones, and are kind of more disordered. You can see that there is more curvature on those tails, but the lipids in the middle, the red ones, are straightforward. And that's the reason you can see those kind of mountains there. They are ordered together, and that's the phase separation. Some lipids are ordered, but others are not. Those are the two phases, right? So, that's, that's uh, the main model we have. From the lipids perspective, let's recall, the main difference is the cholesterol, ah, well, this is the force that you actually need to break those membranes, and it's kind of four times bigger for the naked mole rat. So, whatever it is, it's giving the structural properties, the naked mole rat membrane, against the mouse model or mice model. Just to like review what, what, I, have, what I have just said, the main difference are cholesterol and sphingomelin, right? So, as I said at the beginning, I'm a computational guy. So, how can I study this? I need to make a model, right? And those are the key features I want to model. I don't want to model all the other lipids that are the same. First, I would like to try to focus on the lipids that are different, right? Make sense? Well, that's what we wanted to do. <laughs> In order to do that, we use um, molecular dynamic simulations and you can think of them as a computational microscope. Now I'm thinking, perhaps I misspelled something there, but doesn't matter. And this computational microscope basically works using the Newton's second law and with the characterization of the energy, right? So I won't speak that much about it, but it's not that trivial to have a force field, you have a lot of electrostatics and information about the chemistry of the molecules you want to study. Obviously, if you have a bad force field, then you can have bad results. And there are many force fields. And usually, when there are many of something, that means that none of them is good. <laughs> but, well, <laughs> that's what we have. It is what it is. So we started studying with this, but we 
found kind of a problem. On our membranes, we start seeing ripples. And at the beginning, we were like, oh, ripples. Perhaps that's related with naked mole rat. And that's the difference. And if, actually, yeah, let me say this again. Like, if you find something, then you need to be sure that what you're finding is real, right? You need to really understand that what you are doing makes sense. So, well, we start kind of reading about this ripple phase. And I told you, the, well, a few slides ago, that there are basically two lipid phases, like the health phase, which is ordered, and the liquid phase, which is disordered. There is one phase in the middle, which is called the ripple phase. And this ripple phase is actually not well understood. Some people believe that it's a combination of those two phases, the gel phase and the liquid phase. Other people have uh, proposed that there is a third phase. So the combination of those two plus another one. Anyway, so we wanted to study this ripple phase to understand what was happening with our model. And we went to the most, or the most studied lipid, which is DPPC. And we make a membrane. Something that I haven't told you is that when we found the ripple was because we were working with a bigger membrane. Well, not that big, around 500 lipids. So the first thought was like perhaps the size of the system was having problems. So that's the reason we work with DPPC, 500 lipids of DPPC. And we found a ripple again. This may not be surprising for you, but it was not reported for smaller systems, this kind of uh, ripple phase, right? So we start digging out what was happening here and trying to understand what is the ripple phase? What's happening here? Now, in order to work with this, we use a computational tool called GTree. You may be familiarized with GR or RDF, radial distribution function, which is kind of the picture on the left side, where basically you see like the local packing against the the bulk packing, and you have an idea or how the things are organized. This G3 is an extension of it. Now, you will take three particles. So, picture the blue one. You are the blue one. And your first question is, which is my closest neighbor? And it's the yellow one. Now, from this, you're going to start moving on an angular um, side well, component and a radial component. And you're going to start looking for another particle, right? So, in that way, you will have information from the radial distance and the angular, angular position with respect to the closest neighbor from that particle. Now, here we are seeing one tail. So, uh, I cannot write, I'm sorry. If we move from theta i and r i, we can find the first neighbor, right? This will be the first atom, which is the closest one, but not, well, which is the, the closest, closest one without the closest. <laughs> sorry. And you can still be increasing, for example, here, let's say we fix the angle, and you can start increasing the distance, the radial distance. And you will find eventually those atoms, right? How does that look? Well, like this. In this picture, we are pointing those atoms that are marked on the lipid part, the tail part. 
Now, so this plot is the distance against the cos cosine of the angle. So we will have, again, this information about distance and angle with respect to your closest neighbor. If we now look upstairs to the other angle, then we can find the other four atoms that they are closer to this specific one. And you can see those, those um, red dots that they're marking them. Now, if you start moving more the angle, letting the angle move more and the distance too, then you can find those regions which will mean the other atoms of either your second tail or the other tails around the lipid you are studying, right? This is just if you have like curiosity to see like ideal gas, how would that plot will look like, which makes sense, everything goes to one. Now, the question is, yeah, this looks pretty. I intuitively think that this has information and I can characterize the lipids with this, but how, right? And here we were spending a lot of time <laughs> trying to see, oh, this region is bigger than this one, it's more red than this one, blah, blah, blah. But at the end was more like on a personal level, trying to make some sense out of those colors. And that was a hard work. So we implemented a way of getting out information from these G3 plots. So from the trajectory, trajectory data, we have the individual lipids, so we have 500 of them, and we can calculate this G3 per lipid. And once we start calculating per lipid, then we are getting the formation of the lipid itself, the structure of the, of the lipid, right? I'm sorry. And now we use this similarity index. And here is just a picture of how this thing works. So on all those Einstein pictures, the mean square error is the same. But you can see that they are not the same. One of them, or at least, yeah, a couple of them make sense. The other ones are noisy, right? So this metric was created for IMAGE analysis to have, to have an idea of what kind of image was better, right? Uh, how they are structurally similar to each other. So we use that with those G3 images that we were having. And then we construct this matrix, lipid against lipid. So basically what we did was reduce the dimensionality of our problem. And now it's where the machine learning happened. So now we have those, that information, and the question is how can we characterize it, right? And we let the computer tell us what's happening. So the computer was able to find four clusters. And one may think, oh, the computer said that. Then it's perfect, let's publish a paper. But we should know that it's not just like that. We have to prove and we have to go and see what's happening, right? Well, this is the, the protocol was, that was used for the clustering. And once we go and see the lipids and see what was happening there, we found that on the, on the lipid A will be a, a representation of a classic lipid ordered. The B will be a classic lipid disordered. What we found in our systems was that we found two new phases, which are pretty much the same, but with split tails. 
And let me, let me show you. Okay, well, once we saw this, we further analyzed it using PCA, Principal Component Analysis. And let's see how it looks, those faces under the G tree, right? So on the panel A, we have, again, the classic lipid order. If you can compare it with the panel B, which is the disordered one, you can, see, well, it's actually marked in the picture, the gouge. And those are the main difference between the classic ones. But now let's see C and D, which are the same versions with the split versions of them. And you can see a gap in the middle. And that gap is the split thing that I'm saying, right? Those tails are away from each other. If we see the PCA principal component analysis, let's compare B against C. B will be the classical disordered phase, where you can see pretty much the, the range of movement of those tails. And if you compare B against C, there is a bigger separation on the middle which is the split part I'm saying. It's more obvious if we compare D against E. D will be the ordered one, the ordered phase, the hell one. If you compare against E, now you can see that split really being there. So one thing that I wanted to emphasize is at the beginning I told you that they didn't know about this ripple phase. And they thought it was a combination of those two phases. And here I'm showing you that it's not just a combination of two, it's a combination of four, but they're also localized, right? On blue is the ordered lipids. And they are on the major arm. Well, okay, now I'm thinking. Perhaps here will be better. Yeah. So most of them are on the major arm, the order one. And these funny conformations of split and disordered lipids are on the minor arm. So they are not just different, but they are also localized on the ripple itself. So, just to conclude, we have characterized or proposed the existence of two new lipid phases. Now we think we can understand what is the ripple phase. Ah, by the way, something I didn't mention is that there is uh, some experimental papers which agree on what we're saying at some level. And this G3 protocol that we think can be useful for a lot of our collaborators on the molecular dynamics side, but also to, to use it far away from it, right? Like as radial distribution function is important, this tool can also be important. And we really believe that we can start making a lot of things here. And well, just for Northern grads, now we have a new tool <laughs> to return studying what we wanted to study, which is the Alzheimer's disease, the Alzheimer's memory. Oh, I'm sorry for that. And the acknowledgments, well, was led by the Professor Michael Cartunin on the middle from um, Western University. Matthew Davis is a postdoc of him, and Frankel Daniel from uh, University of Newcastle in UK, and I would like to share with you that this information is, has been accepted on a biophysical journal paper. We were happy about it recently, as you can see. And well, acknowledgement to the people that paid and the resources that we use for computing. And I'm open for any question. Thank you.
All right, uh, we have time for questions. I think I miss the part uh, where, uh, how, how do you explain the different lipids, uh, the disorder, the order, that I think it, uh, that generate uh, uh, this uh, uh, phase separation that you mentioned, uh, but what, uh, what is the origin of these different uh, lipids? How, why they are different? There are some chemical components or something like that? So, they are the same thing, they are the same lipids. So, because I know you. <laughs> Just imagine that problem. Or perhaps the other one, it's, it's better. Right? Or what was the other one? Just imagine this conformation, right? How would you put lipids there? So those split tails are like the, the, they help to actually make these kind of structures. And something that I forgot to mention is that the ripple phase, it's in the middle of the main transition. So, Picture that the, the membrane is almost ready to transitionate to the new state, to the fluid state. So this was for, for, for all the people that are experimentalists and they do calorimetry. They can see a small peak before the, the main phase transition. And this, whatever is happening between those two peaks, usually it's a ripple phase. So it's kind of I mean, obviously, I cannot say like, oh, it's perhaps working about the energetical part, if it's what you're kind of going for. It would be interesting to see like why the membrane is, is getting that conformation, right? Yeah, in that part, like why the membrane goes to that conformation, I wouldn't have an, an answer. But what it has been seen experimentally, experimental has seen is this conformation. Right? So from the energetic view, it would be interesting to, to think why, why the membrane goes in that way to prepare for the main transition, right? But as far as I know, there is no... The membrane is a Helfrich model, a discontinuum yeah. model. So, uh, if you have boundary conditions where um, the membrane is, and there are some conditions you can gen generate the, um, the curvature in the membrane, but uh, I don't know if, if is it, this is the mechanism here, or is something chemical that produces the ripples? This is the question. It should be thermodyna thermodynamical. Uh, in tropics. It, it, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, picture... Uh, uh, well, actually, I think it's it's hidden somewhere. <laughs> Let me show the cards under my. So, so picture that you're kind of negative annealing. You are cooling the system, so you start from fluid phase, and then you start going down and down, and then you see the ripple phase. So below 370, 330, then you see the ripple phase, right? So again, it's, it's more ther thermodynamical based than, than chemical. Any other question? Uh, can you go to the previous slide that you were discussing? Uh, please let me know. <laughs> the one with the, with the ripple phase, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that one. So actually, that lipid in, on the left is uh, with the uh, splitting, right? Open confirmation. This place, yeah. That, that's the, like... The, the tails. Yeah, the, the big one, you mean, right? Yes. Actually, that one... I don't even remember, <laughs> honestly. But oh, yeah, okay. now that you're saying... Yeah. Yeah, it looks... That one, I remember... Yeah, I one randomly, sorry. I remember in my undergrad studies that we studied the relaxation 
of the lipid membrane. And what we found is that if there's a splitting like that one, there's a cholesterol molecule in between those. Uh, That's actually a, a fair point, and I don't want to discuss it because you will steal my paper. <laughs> no, no, no. Bob. That's something that we were thinking here because here we have cholesterol and it's fingomalin. So yeah, we are thinking that this, this kind of uh, mechanism may be related with cholesterol. And cholesterol-rich uh, membranes may have interesting phases here. And we are, actually, yeah, that's the thing. We are now, again, the Alzheimer's disease is waiting because now we want to characterize more kind of membranes to see what's happening. But yeah, that's a really good observation. No, oh, thank you. So I, have, I have a question. So your simulations are all atom, coarse grain? No, all atom. All atom, OK. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We actually tried to reproduce this ripple phase on Martini coarse grain models. We were not able. No, exactly. Yeah, a size constraint, it seems. Yeah, no, no, no size. Uh, I think it's more entropic. You lose entropic yeah. contributions with the coarse grain. Yeah. yeah. And the other question is, uh, do you think these, the phases are the origin of the ripples? Or the fact that it's getting <laughs> curvature is making... It's, it's if, forcing I mean, it. you, you, see, you see it clearly with that. Yeah. The, where you have a lot of curvature right there, that's what yeah, you When have. you induce it, then you, you make it happen, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a kind of a chicken That's a tricky question. Thing. Yeah, Wait, what is first? The egg of, of the chicken? I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to know that. Which one makes the other one? Yeah. I mean, in, on simulations, you have to go a larger scale, like 500. Oh, well, also the temperature, right? <laughs> And you have to go cooling down, so, yeah. On, on your heat maps, heat map. does the, the, the ripples are, I mean, you're showing us like a, a, a cut, right? Yeah. In, in the other dimension, are, are they symmetric? <sighs> I was wondering, and it's a question of complete ignorance, yeah, whether these may be some kind of topological phase transition, like 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 a dislocation thing yeah. or something. Yeah, and yeah, you can actually, if you see on the top, you see on the top, top and bottom, there are some difference in the composition. So yeah, actually there are difference in composition between the top okay. leaflet or the bottom leaflet. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I yeah, was yeah, thinking I know, that's solid a, state. That's uh, the reason it's a hearing slide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. I think I saw some other question. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, my English is so bad, but I don't will worry, try. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we see that we can characterize the ripple phase and uh, difference with the hell phase and the disorder phase, liquid phase. But physically, why, why or oh, what makes the ripple fates so interested, uh, interesting, or why the the ripple fates uh, can ignore these polypeptides or the disease of Alzheimer uh, than the another on other phase can can make like mechanical structure is roughness is stronger and can penetrate inside of the cell or why why uh, why the ripple fades is it's it's the reason that the the yeah the the i don't know the red the the rat that what's yeah, yeah. ugly i don't know i don't remember yeah, naked the mole rat and mouse yes. yeah yeah so if i understand correctly the first question will be like, what's the relevance between the ripple and the Alzheimer's disease we were talking, right? So, the simple answer is, I don't know, right? We may think that this actually is related with cholesterol and we want to see what's happening. Now, we have a major problem that I'm not saying. I told you that you cannot see this thing on 128 DPPC lipids. And that's a model of just one lipid. 
we were using two types of lipids. And from sphingomelin, we were using like three different tail lengths. So one question that we have is that, are we having some size problem? And the more lipids we use, the bigger the system has to be? We don't know. So, I mean, that, that's an open question that we have to kind of be thinking about it. And we'll be like to, I would be rushing to answer you something, right? But the answer is really, I don't know. We want to work on that. But, <laughs> I mean, science is not just about solving questions, right? It's also about publishing papers. <laughs> but we have this tool and we want to publish more papers, right? So, <laughs> I mean, th that's what it is. People will lie you if, oh, everything is just beauty, no? <laughs> but yeah, we will, we're planning to address that question in the near future. Uh, Lina? Publish or perish? <laughs> Hi. Oops. So, um, when you showed us slides after your thank you notes, you showed one that had the, the, the phase transition for the membrane. Yeah, it's a little move, right? Is what you're yeah, ahead, ahead, ahead. You mean this one, right? That one. Yeah, that's calculated. Yeah, it's what our simulations gave us. So basically, we were having a model with those lipids and we start cooling it down. Okay. And we were measuring, well, characterizing those phases with the technique we set. And it's not like calculated, but measuring. Yeah, what, okay, then the question is, is the transition temperature the experimental one? It's, I mean, okay, this phase transition actually, uh, let me see if I have it here. Oh, I forgot to put it. So, it's a little moved. I don't recall where. Uh, it's, it's a little moved. Usually when you do molecular dynamic simulations, you will, well, almost never hit exactly the phase transition. Uh -huh. But what I wanted to tell you is that if you measure like classic things, like um, aripolipid or like um, ah, order parameter, you will find the, fa the same transition. Please remind me which force field you used? Charm. That's Charm 36? Y trace. Yeah, I don't recall. You have several burst Charm. The, the I'm pretty sure it's the, uh, the latest lipid one from Richard Pastor and family. I'm pretty sure, yeah, we were, actually that's, that's one of the questions we were having at the beginning. And I'm talking about years, so I actually kind of missed that. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it's because we were discussing that with other people that this is not a mistake of, of a force field, or we were thinking. No, what surprises me is that, okay, so please again remind me, what's the length of the chains, of the lipid chains? How many carbons do you have? Yeah, it's DPPC, the classic D DPPC. One. Yeah. Okay, so that's pretty close to the actual melting temperature of the membrane. Yeah. And that's remarkable because at least for proteins, the melting temperatures are exaggerated like 80 degrees. So the fact that for membranes, you hit the right uh, 100 degree interval is fantastic. Now, the other question is, why do you have such a strong size dependence? So you have, everything looks beautiful when you're under 128 lipids, say 64, that's per monolayer, right? Uh, I miss you, what? So I'm looking at the, here you're plotting how many lipids you have. Yeah, the total lipids. Versus temperature. Versus temperature with the phase classification. Like, So if you add those numbers, will it be, five, well, for each line, you will have 520. Okay, so this is the actual number of lipids you find in each yeah, phase. Yeah, yeah. Okay, top. so sorry, I was reading the plot wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, got it. 
Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. I think we move on for the poster session. I think we we can have mo half an hour oh, more perfect. to discuss our nice po posters. So if uh, you can have like ten minutes to make sure that your poster is set, and then we can go upstairs and. Ah, yeah, sí, pueden poner sus postres, gracias. <laughs> <laughs>